Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Everybody. Welcome back to the Future Society, where, as always, we are talking in the present, but talking about the future. Today, I have Mitchell Hora, who is a CEO and leader in the agricultural space. Mitchell, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Agriculture, I feel like, is something that is so important, so integral to our lives, has so many scientific breakthroughs that have really changed humanity for the better. And I think we see a lot of different things happening down the pipeline, and it's hard to make sense of it. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what uh, you're working on right now. I know soil is important to you, sustainable agriculture is important to you, regenerative agriculture is important to you. And hopefully we can talk about as many or as little of that as possible. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing at your company and how that stuff affects us on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, you bet. No, thanks for hanging out here today. It's going to be fun. Uh, lots of different places that we can go to, but uh, number one, I'm a farmer myself. I'm seventh generation on my family's farm. Last year was our 150th year farming in Southeast Iowa. I live in Southeast Iowa with my wife, six years. We've got two little kids who are the eighth generation for our family farm. So for us, you know, it, it, when you are in a business that's multi-generational, 150 years, it, you have to you have to be focused on sustainability and on being not just economically sustainable, but environmentally sustainable as well, right? So that's a lot of the the root of where my passion for this comes from. But in 2015, I started a company called Continuum Ag. We're a software company that helps to scale regenerative ag and helps farmers improve their profitability via improving their soil health. And I think, you know, as this, you know, ties to your overall theme, uh, there was some new numbers that just came out. You know, we have less farmers in this country than ever, less than 2% of the population of Americans is involved in agriculture, yet we feed everyone else, right? You know, less than 2% feeding uh, the other 98% while at the same time providing renewable fuel and fiber for clothing and feed for animals and all the different products that come out of agriculture. Uh, So I think as we look to the future, there's going to be even fewer and fewer farmers, more and more automation, more and more artificial intelligence, robotics, you know, and, and young people like myself going to have to continue to help to lead the charge, right? Bring in more opportunity to farmers and it's going to change really fast. The average age of a farmer is over 60 years old. So there's a lot of change that's got to occur, a lot of pass down to the next generation, um, especially when it comes to agricultural land, which is worth insane amount of money. Mm-hmm. and you know, but it's got to pass down to those next generations, be able to take it over, be able to care for that land and be able to continue to feed people. So yeah, exciting stuff going uh, for the future of ag, where it's not just providing that food and fuel and fiber and feed, but doing it in a manner that has a lower carbon footprint and an improved impact on water quality and improved nutrient density, the quality of the products that we are producing and so many of these necessary outcomes that have to come out of agriculture and the future has got to be a more regenerative future. Simply just meaning we can't just sustain what we're doing today and be complacent. We have to continue to do better. So excited to dig into how we're doing that and where I see things going. Exciting time for sure. And I'm excited to be a young person in this space to be able to ride the wave and try to lead uh, along the way. So I think that When I think about agriculture, I think about, uh, obviously, the food that comes in, right? Our food has significantly changed over the past 100 years. Over the past, like, you know, 500 years, it's really changed a lot, right? And we've kind of had these very specific monocrop type of agricultural systems. And what I really like about the regenerative agriculture is that it's kind of running counter to that, right? From, you know, my very basic understanding, what I, what got me interested in regenerative agriculture was Joe Rogan had a guy mm-hmm. on, uh, I'm sure you probably know him. Yeah, like Joel Salatin. Yeah, name. yeah, yeah. So he's, he's like, you know, my introduction to this whole space, right? And that's something that I really appreciate because 
for a number of reasons. Like I think that Joe brings on like a lot of people, like maybe not that might be at first glass, some at first glance, something that I would be interested in, but it is something like now that I'm interested in it because of, you know, all of like this wealth of knowledge. And that's really why I wanted to talk with you because you run your own podcast about soil. You have a business on soil. You're an eighth generation farmer. We're going to do a deep dive in regards to farming and where it's going. Right. So mm -hmm. I wanted to talk specifically about regenerative agriculture because I feel like it's so different from what we've been doing in the past 50 years, right? And so like, how did it come about? How did you get involved with it? And like, why is it better for us? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a wide continuum of regenerative ag, right? And that's really the name. That's the name of my company, right? Continuum Ag, where there's a variety of extremes to regenerative ag. It's not necessarily a one size fits all, check the box, right? On one side, you've got... The whole principle, though, and the concepts of regenerative ag boils back to mimicking Mother Nature and mimicking the natural system that built up our soils, especially here in the Midwest. We have some of the best soils in the entire world. And the reason that they are so amazing is because of the system that was here for thousands of years and that system being the prairie. Right. So in a prairie system, you don't have disturbance of the soil. There's constant living roots and plants growing at all times. There's a lot of diversity in the system of grasses and legumes and different types of species of, of plants. And then you've got animals and livestock that are roaming across that prairie, being moved in herds and being chased by the predators and such, right? So think of, you know, herds of buffalo being chased by wolves across the landscape, but where you've got hundreds of thousands of buffalo at a time trampling down the grass, but also eating some of it pooping it back out, you know, and stimulating the life that's in this in those soils. But really what a lot of this boils down to, you know, and Regenovag is mimicking that prairie system. And the most important thing that farmers have got to do to be more regenerative is to keep living roots in the system. In our agricultural production system of today, the norm is that we plant our cash crops, usually in the spring, Think of it as corn, right? So we plant corn in usually April. Here in Iowa, anyway, we plant corn in April and we harvest it in October. We plant that corn in April. It really doesn't get up and start growing until May. And then it starts dying in late August and throughout September. So it's really only photosynthesizing from May until August or 1st of September, meaning it's only pulling in CO2 and sunlight energy and water to live for a short time out of the year. And through regenerative ag, we know that we have got to continue to feed our soil and feed the trillions and trillions of microbes that are in our soil. And it takes more photosynthesis to be able to do that. That sunlight energy being captured, plants taking in CO2, just as we respire CO2. Of course, plants take in that CO2 and respire back off oxygen that we can utilize. But plants take in that CO2 and convert it to simple sugars sucrose and glucose, and they can secrete up to 70% of that carbon that they bring in, that sugar that they bring in, they pump upwards of 70% of it back through their roots into the soil to feed the microbes. Hmm. And one teaspoon, a teaspoon of healthy soil, there's more microbes than there are people on the earth, hmm. which is what really makes me excited about this whole thing. Okay. And bring it and pulling it back together is in one teaspoon of healthy soil, more than 8 billion microbes, more microbes than people on the earth in a little teaspoon. We can't see any of them, but an insane amount of life and activity. And those microbes are little fertilizer packets, right? Those microbes are decomposing plant residues. They're eating, pooping each other back out. All they know how to do is eat, reproduce, try to not get eaten and die, right? It's a microbes life. And when those microbes get eaten, uh, or die or get secreted back out, those nutrients become plant available. So as a regenerative farmer, the more I can stimulate the natural biological process, the less I have to rely on inputs that cost a lot of money, inputs such as fertilizer, pesticides. I don't need as much of that stuff because the natural microbial system does it on its own. I relate mm -hmm. a lot of it back to human health, right? If you're healthier as a human, you don't need as much medicine. If you mm -hmm. eat right, take care of yourself, you know, um, have the right diet, have the right, you know, activity, you mm -hmm. stay healthier on your own versus yeah. to be as reliant on medicine. Same thing in our agricultural systems. And today, big ag, we've just kind of got a broken system that we need to mimic mother nature better. 
And to me, regenerative ag really boils down to that simple principle of mimicking mother nature. Yeah, I, I think that the the microbiome research has really expanded uh, relatively recently in like a whole bunch of different fields. Like for you know human beings, we're just beginning to understand the complex interplay between like our gut bacteria, our oral bacteria, you know, all of the different bacteria that's on our skin and such. That stuff is we're on the cusp of understanding that it's really interesting to see that same thing happening in agriculture, but specifically when it comes to regenerative agriculture, I wanted to know, like, how is it better for us other than carbon capture? Like, I know that, you know, it provides quote unquote healthier food, but like objectively, like, I don't understand why it would be. So maybe for somebody that might not be as familiar, what would be some reasons that they would want to be in favor of regenerative agriculture, as opposed to agriculture that is um, still giving them the same product? Yeah, in my mind, I mean, I'm a simple farmer, right? But it's just like on the human health side of things, where if you have a good, healthy gut microbiome, you're going to fend off diseases better and Mm -hmm. uh, pathogens. You're going to get better nutrient cycling, right? Your body's going to be able to get the nutrients out of its food more effectively and get you the right nutrients that you need. Same thing in the soil. If we have good soil microbiome, we're going to fend off pathogens, fend off issues and disease because we're going to have more good guys, right? Mm -hmm. To fend off the bad guys. We're going to get better nutrient cycling, better availability of the nutrients that the plant actually needs. When the plant and the microbes are working together in good symbiosis, they're able to feed off each other, just like us in our our gut. It's the exact same concept. It's just that our gut microbes are on the inside, Mm -hmm. inside of our intestines and stuff for the most part, and inside of our gut. Where in the soil, it's on the outside, the outside of those of those roots and coating the outside of those roots. But really boils down to the more microbes that we can have and the more diversity of microbes we can have, the more diverse functions that we can generate, including fending off those pathogens and cycling nutrients, and the healthier our plants can be. And mm-hmm. the healthier our plants can be, the more that they fend off pathogens like disease and insects and these things that Right now in conventional ag, we spray pesticides to take care of. Well, if the plants can do it on their own, we don't need to apply the pesticides, which for me as a regenerative farmer keeps money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, is healthier for the actual food and products that we're producing too. So are you totally like without pesticides on a regenerative? Not completely without. So back to, I think there's a a spectrum of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my family um, started using no-till in 1978. That's one of the core principles. What does that mean? So that means instead of usually what we do is we plant our corn in the in April, we harvest in October, and typical practice is to then use a tillage pass, which is you drag a heavy implement through the field that turns and mixes the soil and mm-hmm. mixes the residue so that it can break down easier. And mm-hmm. now you have bare exposed soil on top and the residue left over from the previous crop incorporated, which mm-hmm. typically helps to break it down and it, the soil warms up and all that kind of thing. But the problem is when you disturb the soil, you're destroying the home for those microbes. You're releasing carbon out of the soil. You're releasing moisture out of the soil. And over time, it leads to degradation. Mm -hmm. uh, Especially as we farm this ground here in the Midwest for 150, 200 years, uh, over and over and over, it degrades. So no-till means don't disturb that soil. Mm -hmm. Keep it where it is. Keep the residue on top of the surface to protect it against erosion and to keep the soil more in balance in osmosis, just like mother nature intended in that natural prairie system where it wasn't disturbed and dug up and tilled besides by the critters that were doing it in small scale, right? The worms, the beetles, groundhogs, those kind of things that are digging and mixing soil. So we're trying to let the natural system do it. So we've been doing that since 1978 where we don't till the soil, we let mother nature do its do its thing and we try to not disturb the system and then we adopted cover cropping in 2013 which is instead of the normal practice of plant the corn in april harvest it in october and then wait until the next april what we do is we plant a cover crop in october which is typically a grass like cereal rye is one of the main uh, cover crops that's utilized and uh, we utilize that cereal rye because it does very good in our winters here in Iowa, which of course we get very cold, we get snow, um, you know, a typical Midwest winter, but we can plant these cover crops that keep the ground covered, keep photosynthetic activity going to capture that carbon from the atmosphere and put it into the ground to keep feeding 
those microbes. So after time here of doing that, we have decreased our fertilizer by about 50%. We've decreased our pesticides by about 75%. Wow. While at the same time, building our yield, building more resiliency, relying less on the government. Uh, for crop subsidies and things like federal crop insurance. Um, so we're not completely to using none of that stuff, right? Guys like Joel uh, Salatin that was on Joe Rogan, guys like Rick Clark, guys like Gabe Brown, some of these guys that are, have pushed this further than we have on our farm. Um, I really believe there's a there's kind of a broad spectrum to this, right? That continuum of yeah. you can be down a regenerative path and um and be doing good just like in human health right yeah you can be yeah. to the extreme and an athlete never drink, you know work so out you, every, yeah. yeah you know work out every day only eat good stuff never drink mm. alcohol or you can kind of be in the middle right mm -hmm. kind of cautious mostly doing okay but um you still do some stuff that you know is maybe not the best for you but as long as you do more good than bad you're at least moving in a positive direction so let's zoom out for a second. Another insight that I wanted to talk with you about is you are an eighth generation farmer. You have seen in your family the trend from family farms to industrial farms, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like one of the real benefits of technology is that it democrat it has the power to democratize mm -hmm. anything, really, right? Like, I mean, if you look at, you know, like the space race, for example, right? Like Initially, it was only the government that was allowed to do this or able to do this. And now it's become like a commercial industry where yeah. realistically, like any of us, if we were rich enough, can go to space, right? Sure. Sure. But also, I think that just like on a lower level, like just even computational power, right? Computational power, you know, in our phones, we have the ability to do calculations. We have the ability to do things like set up a website. You know, if I had a barbershop, I could, you know, set up a website and whereas, you know, take online appointments, I would be able to, you know, democratize that industry, whereas, you know, maybe only Supercuts or one of these like large national chains might be able to have the same kind of marketing dollars that, you know, right. um, uh, would have happened in like the the past, right? A lot of new technology is happening in the agricultural industry, everything from like robots to different chemical treatments to, you know, this whole push for regenerative agriculture. Do you see that being democratized or do you think that that like has that has yeah. all of these steps that you've made in your family farm made you more competitive with in comparison to the big guys? You bet. So a couple a lot to a lot to unpack there. Number one, push back a little bit on the just the corporate aspect, right? It's still about ninety eight percent of farms in the U.S. are family farms. Oh, that's great. Like, I, don't, I don't know that, you know, because I'm yeah. not in the industry. No, 100%. That's what I like. I appreciate it. It's your, you know, your view on it is the norm, right? That where it's mm -hmm. the corporations and stuff. Now, it's absolutely part of it, right? There are some huge corporate um, operations and stuff, but by and large, 98% still family farms, family run organizations, just like mine. Now, my family's farm is also a corporation, right? Mm -hmm. my, my parents' operation is set up as a corporation. Yeah my farm is set up as an LLC. Mm -hmm. Okay. So limited liability corporation. It's just the legal structure, right? Yeah. Just like, just like in, in any other business. You yeah, do like it I, I have a corporation for, for my private practice versus exactly. like my academic practice. Yeah, I get it. Exactly. So it's just set up as a, as a corporation, right? Our family farm in total is about 700 acres. Um, I believe the stat is that the typical or the average farm is about 400 acres. Mm -hmm. uh, but really in my mind as like, what does it take to actually be like a my typical farm that I see, right? Usually the typical farm in my neck of the woods is around 1,000 to 1,500 acres. That's kind of, uh, so my family's farm of 700, that's my parents out there on the farm full time. It is their main source of, of income, right? That is their main job. But that typical conventional row crop agriculture farm, you got to kind of be that 700 at the minimum, but a lot of folks in that 1,000 to 1,500. So with us being only 700, that has absolutely prompted us to say, we do need to decrease those pesticides. Like I mentioned, we've done by 75%. We do need to be more efficient with fertilizer because we've got to be competitive. And regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture has absolutely allowed us that to be able to do that. My farm is 40 acres. Okay. So I bought a little 40 acre piece of ground right after I graduated Iowa State. I've got degrees in agronomy and in ag systems technology. Had the opportunity to uh, to buy some ground from a neighbor lady, 
It's right around the corner from my fa- my parents' uh, main farm. It's Built in babysitting, one- which is perfect. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a <laughs> once in a generation type of opportunity. You gotta yeah. jump on it, right? Yeah. And uh, land is is extremely expensive. It's really hard to get into large scale row crop agriculture because of the land being so expensive to put a number on it uh call it most of the land around here is going around sixteen thousand dollars an acre plenty of land that's twenty thousand dollars an acre or more and if you're going to try to buy a thousand acres to have the typical farm you're talking real money yeah then you've got to have tractors and a combine and all this equipment You know, you're talking a couple million dollars worth of equipment. I mean, that's what you hear about, right? You hear about Bill Gates buying up all the the farmland out there. You know, that that's what trickled down into the public consciousness, like myself, somebody who's not in the industry, you know. So it's nice to hear that people like yourself still have the ability to enter into this industry because you love it, you know. Correct. Correct. And but I think you're right that that regenerative piece allows us to be more competitive. It allows Mm -hmm. us to utilize data to work with Mother Nature and not against her. Like in Mm -hmm. big ag today, we've kind of been working against mother nature, mm-hmm. just like in, in human health, I think too. Right. And in, mm-hmm. in our diets and stuff, eating a lot yeah. of processed food that's working against mother nature, right? It's yeah. the same concept yeah. and we can all do better. And I think we're becoming more aware, right? Mm-hmm. Especially younger folks becoming more aware that we can do better. Uh, but it takes data to be able to do that. Just like in human health. Now there's better data for soil, for our carbon footprint, for utilizing this information to make better decisions that are going to make us more profitable and more sustainable. Yeah, the data the data piece is huge because I feel like with 40 acres, you can tightly control that data, yeah. right? When you get to a thousand acres, it might be a little bit more difficult, you know, mm-hmm. which is why like I, I personally I feel like there's this uh line in academic research, garbage in, garbage out. So like if you have garbage data in, then you're gonna get garbage insights out, you know? And sure. so one of the things that we tr- tightly try to control is just the reliability and um the robustness of the data. So I feel like if you have the ability to like really tightly control it, like that would be something that would be a competitive advantage in the 21st century. Maybe it wasn't as important in the 20th century, but like data is king right now, you know? And And that's really where where like my company came in too, helping farmers with data intelligence, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's the key thing there is garbage data in, garbage data out. Mm -hmm. It's the intelligence as Mm -hmm. to we can have all this data that we want, but if you don't know what to do with it, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to actually make the right decision, you know? And um, so, and I, I see that with a wide array of farms. I think you're, there's some truth to what you're saying though. I, on my small farm, I can really go to the nuance of the mm-hmm. data and really mm-hmm. fine tune because I've got the, the time and ability to be able to get really nuanced. But I mean, at Continuum Ag, we've got farmers that are 10, 15, 30, 40,000 acre farms, big operations. They're all family farms too, mm-hmm. uh, to point out. Mm-hmm. Family operations, but they're huge, right? Big time, like very much big business. Mm-hmm. And uh, these mm-hmm. guys are very good at data. They might not be able to make the decisions with the really detailed nuance, mm-hmm. um, but- by and large are utilizing that data to absolutely move in the right direction. They're just making decisions at a larger scale than on my little 40 acres yeah. where I'm dorking around with all kinds of little nitpicky stuff where at scale, you've got to make decisions and go. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you, have you heard the um, like the difference between Bayesian probability and then um, I think it's like progressivist probability. Yeah. I can't remember the second one, but like, it's exactly what you're talking about. So in, in the, like the clinical side of it, like if you're comparing two drugs, right, you could give it to 10,000 people and you could see what shakes out, right? Or you could do a really, really tightly controlled evaluation for like 40 people and then do that same really tightly controlled evaluation on 40 other people and then do that same tightly controlled evaluation on 40 other people and then see what shakes out in comparison to all of those three. Sure. And so that's the last one is is the Bayesian probability, right? And like that has been, at least in my world, like the statistical analysis, whether it's marketing or whether it's, you know, academic research, it's something that's like really in vogue right now. So that's why I, that's where I see as a competitive advantage for a really small, tightly controlled, you know, everything that's coming in and everything that's going out. Right. And like, that's something that I feel like is 21st century thinking. Like that's something that I see. And and what I hope for is somebody like yourself being 
as competitive or more competitive as we get some of like the uh, like the labor systems to be more democratized? Like, can you imagine when there's yeah. agricultural robots that you know can do everything a human being can do? Like, mm -hmm. I like for I mean, there's I was been on the spotlight just because of politics recently, and yeah. so I was watching a lot of like. Like you guys are working really hard as farmers, you yeah. know, like yeah. as hard or hard or as harder as like we work as surgeons, you know, and I'm like, dang, like these, and it's like physical work too, yeah. you know? Yeah. But it ends up being, uh, it's training those robots and stuff, right. To be able to make yeah. decisions on the fly where then we can, we can take like what I can do on my small farm to really make nuanced decisions, right. If we can train the machine learning to be able to make those nuanced decisions more repetitive, more accurately than what I could do as a individual, now we can, yeah, combine those two together, right? Where mm -hmm. large operations can utilize machine learning, can utilize technology to make those nuanced decisions like a small operation could. Mm -hmm. but it's through technology, absolutely. Yeah. So very much seeing the, that trend continue to, to take off. Um, but we got a long way to go in that, right? But I think agriculture is becoming a little bit more sexy in terms of venture capital and startup companies. And uh, so a lot of interesting things happening in that space to yeah. bring more opportunity to ag, but yeah, long way to go. Cause farmers by and large, like I think of any humans, we don't necessarily always like change, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. keeping the same. We've been doing this for a long time. We want to, we know that it works. We're going to keep doing what we're doing, but, mm -hmm. uh, but with a aging agricultural population, that need for change and accelerated progress is very much going to be the trend. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to cause for very rapid evolution uh, within agriculture. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely becoming very in vogue right now, you know, I to at least have an idea of like agriculture, just because after the pandemic, when we had all these like food shortage potentials, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody that I talked to was like, we need to start growing our own food. We need yeah. to like move <laughs> to the mountains and, you know, start doing that. And like, I was one on the bandwagon. I, I got this, uh, this farming simulator video game called yep. Stardew Valley. Okay. I seriously spent over a thousand hours on that thing. Like, over a thousand hours on a completely virtual farm that will never produce a single crop. And, you know, like that to me, I felt like that was like, okay, like this could be really interesting. And it's something that like, all my friends talked about. Like we all were like, you know, we, we're going to get a camper and we're going to outfit it so that we could go anywhere. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's really, really popular right now. And I hope, I really honestly hope that it can be democratized enough that yeah. a person like me that, you know, hires the right company to set up a farm mm -hmm. and the robots are doing it. Like I can just sit back and like eat my fresh, you know, yeah. regenerative organic yeah. burger, you know, that I bite into like that's yeah. that, that is a dream that I think everybody would want. And honestly, yeah. it's a dream that it's not just like from me, like it's, it's other futurists are also thinking about this. There's like this idea when you're saying come back to nature that maybe we've gotten a little bit too far from yeah. where we were meant to go. So like, let's come, let's, let's scale it back a little bit, still have all of the benefits of technology, but make it so that it serves humans and human well-being and things like that. Yeah. So that's something that I would really hope for. Like, what do you see? Do you see yeah, that I think, happening? I think do you there's see some that balance in that, right? I mean, yeah. like I mentioned before, less than 2% of Americans directly involved in that production agricultural space. I don't think we're going to go back to it being 50%, you know, or whatever mm -hmm. it was back when they were settling and everything. But um, but I think more so, uh, some people are going to be able to do exactly what you're talking, right? Have like a garden or have a little, you know, operation, but it takes a heck of a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, depending on where you are. Like you might be, if you're growing vegetables, say in a vegetable garden, if you've got winter time, you're only growing these vegetables for one harvest in a year. Mm -hmm. right? So how are you going to eat the rest of the year? Like if you're eating those fresh fruits and veggies, they're there for a, a couple of weeks or a couple of months out of the year, depending on when those crops are coming readily available. But you got to be able to know now know how do you can them? You know, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you jar them and be able to to keep them over the winter time? How do you process some of those things like that burger? It's a cow to start mm -hmm. with. You got to mm -hmm. be able to butcher that thing. You got to be able to know how to handle it. And um, yeah, the and, robots, and there's a lot dude, of regulation. The robots, the robots are coming. <laughs> when robots we get, will come. When we get right. when we get livestock robots, that's going to be a, a big deal for me. That's Shoot. when I'm going to move to Iowa and I'm going to set there up my go. own farm. That sounds but, good. And the, it's coming, right? There's a virtual fencing and stuff like shock collars, like what dogs have, where yeah. you can put up a virtual fence, you can move it on yeah. your phone. I think more so my, my, my vision of where I think this goes, though, is just more transparency between mm -hmm. – 
farmers and consumers where you might not have to actually manage and operate and own a farm, but you're more connected with the people who do. And you mm -hmm. have, you know, maybe the ability to, to be an investor in it or have fractionalized mm -hmm. agriculture, stuff like that. I think there's opportunity there. Um, I think there's opportunity around NFTs in this space mm -hmm. to be able to do that and be able to track and be able to have, uh, you know, tokenization of land, of agricultural products, of all that kind of thing. So maybe it's not that you've got your, you know, five cows, but you have fractional interest in a bunch of different cows mm -hmm. or, in, or in an operation where um, you understand and have transparency as to how it's being produced mm -hmm. and you're able to be able to support that and get direct connectivity and feedback for the products coming off of that land. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think mean, that's it's, where it's, a lot of this will go. But. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's tough to, you know, make accurate predictions about the future, but one of the things that I feel like is not necessarily the best prediction is there was a huge buzz about uh, vertical farming and completely hydroponic uh, systems and stuff like that. And again, pandemic, got me into this. I I bought my own hydroponic system. And what I was surprised, two things. Number one, it was first off, it was very difficult. You know, I feel like as just like somebody who's doing it like in in passing, you know, there was a lot of cleaning that was involved that I wasn't expecting. But the amount of biomass that I was able to create from like this small little wall was crazy. That's you awesome. know, and it, it was it was really interesting to see just like the amount of, you know, just food that I could produce if I really wanted to, you know. But for whatever reason, it hasn't shaken out like the, you know, the expenditures for vertical farming and hydroponics, like the energy. I mean, it just makes so much more sense to use the sun, right? Like it's just yeah. not even like a comparison. Yeah. I mean, but it's early days in this stuff, right? So I think that being one of it, like the sun is the real source of energy for and why we have life on this planet altogether, right? So we mm -hmm. need to, to harness that better. I think there's some balance to that, right? Maybe being able to do more rooftop type stuff or being able to still get the food closer to the consumers, but some balance to it. The other piece that I wonder, I definitely know that there's going to be more of that hydroponics and vertical farming, but the most important thing in building up that health is the biological component. Hmm. I really worry that when we take those plants that are supposed to grow in soil, yeah. or there's that 8 billion microbes in just one teaspoon of soil. When we remove that, I yeah. wonder if we're removing that diversity of nutrient to get into those, those plants, right? That to me, it just ends up being very unnatural, right? Yeah. Where we're looking at more natural food, healthier food. Like there's nothing more unnatural Mm -hmm. Then that. Now, I think there's balance to it, right? I've got buddies that are in that space. I think we're going to get better, mm -hmm. but it's those microbes in that microbiome that actually creates the health of those plants and therefore the health of the human. So I just, I've never seen any of the data or the research in the yeah. difference there between the nutrient density of those hydroponic crops versus others. I'm sure they can taste good, you know? And yeah. Well, healthy. there's actually, that. that's where I uh, think that the the real goal is for hydroponics is that you know have an industrial base for the majority of agriculture for like everything that we eat on a regular basis but to have specialized vegetables or fruits that have a different taste like use it almost as like a scientific experiment because yeah. they have the uh these strawberries that are being grown in new jersey that are like the sweetest strawberries that you've ever had you know and there's a market for it because these people are paying like 25 bucks for, you know, like six strawberries, right? So it's like a delicacy as opposed, it's, I know it sounds crazy, but like it exists. And like the, the guy went from like one research lab to now he's, I think he's got like three or four, mm -hmm. which is not the trend for the majority of these, you know, types of spaces. So for whatever he's doing is working, it was like, you know, written up in a few different news article sources. But I think that's the trend that I see is that it's going to be more like selective. Like if I really want to know what like the best blueberry in the world tastes like, it's going to have to be grown in a lab, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to like, if I want really excellent blueberries that I'm going to put into a pie or if I'm going to, you know, just have like at the table, I think that that's where someone like yourself and doing like something in like the most holistic beneficent way possible like that's that's where the majority of the food should be coming from in my opinion well and there's balance to it right where in the lab you take mother nature out of the equation mm -hmm. and in my you know farming system that's all outside mother nature is the number one driver of mm -hmm. hopefully success right mm -hmm. by 
working in mother nature's image and building up that robustness of the microbial community in the soil to be able to hopefully make us more resilient to mm -hmm. weather and whether it be too dry or too wet, too hot, too cold, what have you. But we're always subject to whatever mother nature throws at us. It's always going to influence that outcome at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, there's a balance to the whole thing, but nonetheless, I mean, the, it's, it ends up boiling back to the focus on outcome, the focus on quality, the focus on nutrient density and being able to yeah, be more regenerative. That's a good trend that we're, that we're on, right? That's got a long, long way to go, but at least it's very much so picking up speed to, uh, set up that, you know, set ourselves up for success here in the future. Yeah. Well, how do you feel? So the last uh, topic I just wanted to cover is how do you feel about robots in the ag space? Because I feel yeah. like that's that's the the next trend that people are hoping to um, revolutionize just industry in general. Mm -hmm. And I know that especially agriculture was very quick to adopt industrial agriculture from, you know, like a efficiency perspective. Yeah. And like, you know, you, those huge combines and like, you know, the huge tractors. I mean, that's, that's like something that it, it you don't see to the amount of work that is necessary to create something like that you don't see in like a city system like you don't see like a giant like excavator that's the same size as something that's like on an industrial farm like that is a huge op machine right yeah. and so now you have more uh precise and human oriented robots like tesla's optimus and a bunch of different like warehouse uh, type of robots. And I feel like that's going to really revolutionize a whole number of different industries, but specifically when it comes to agriculture, like, do you see a role for that? Is that something yeah. that would democratize the ability to make food? Very much so. I think, uh, you know, it's very much going to start in more permanent crops and more specialty crops like those fruits and vegetables that are going to that end consumer. And that's really where a lot of these companies are starting, right? A lot mm -hmm. of the agriculture that's on the on the coast and more specialty type of crops for Midwest lart like row crop corn soybeans wheat those kind of things it's kind of in the middle right where my tractor I'm sitting in the cab when I'm driving it but I can hit a button and it drives itself on a straight line following a GPS guidance to the tune of less than one inch of accuracy right mm -hmm. so very accurate, very much able to be super efficient to stay one path over from the last pass that I made. So I'm not overlapping. I'm not spreading myself out too much. So I'm being very efficient. But I think the biggest thing with large scale row crop ag where robots are going to fall a little, where they're a little bit further out is how do we refill and how do we solve for problems and stuff. So for example, one of the tasks that a robot will absolutely do eventually in agriculture is plant. Okay, so when I fill up my corn planter, I can plant a set allotment of acres and then I run out of corn and I have mm -hmm. to stop and physically refill it. Mm -hmm. So if a robot's going to completely do that on its own, the refilling process also has to be automated. So that's one of the limitations today. The robots already today could plant on their own. Absolutely. That's already happening. But a human still has to be there to refill it. Mm -hmm. Now, you could have one human refilling five robots, right? Mm -hmm. be more efficient that way. Absolutely the case. But that's one of those limitations of refilling, uh, refueling, like on the combine, for example, it's I have to empty out that combine once the tank gets full, the grain tank. So I can only harvest so much, then the grain tank gets full, I need to empty that tank into a wagon. And that wagon takes the grain to a grain bin, or hauls it off of the field, right where I can store it and then sell it. So it's some of those next steps of how do I handle the product that I'm applying or handle how do I handle the product that I am harvesting? And uh, when you're talking about the volumes of corn and soybeans, it's just massive amounts that uh, it takes huge equipment to be able to automate that at the scale needed. And that's where I'm more bullish on uh, robots are already helping in those specialty crops where we're just talking about handling apples or handling strawberries or blueberries that we're talking smaller volumes of allotments and smaller packaging and things like that. That's easier for today's type of robotics, but absolutely going to continue to come to large scale agriculture. Absolutely. Where I see my farm in the future, that there's going to be less and less folks that are involved in broad scale row crop agriculture. So those of us who are involved are going to have to be able to handle more with less people 
and it's going to require automation, robotics, artificial intelligence. Absolutely has to be there to uh, to get that done. Um, mm-hmm. So the trend is I'm ultra bullish on the trend. I just think we're going to see it in these specialty crops before uh, broad acre row crops, but already seeing at least a middle ground, right? Where it's GPS guidance. It's just not full automation. We have done drones on our farm. We've been experimenting with these things, but for example, I've, I've used heli- small helicopter type drones that can spread cover crops or, um, you know, apply seeds or fertilizer, but they only, they only hold a payload. I think at the time we were messing with the one, it was holding like 35 pounds worth of payload. And I was applying a cover crop at, in a lot of cases, we apply about 45 pounds to the acre. So it has to be refilled more than once an acre. And even on our small farm of 700 acres, you got to refill the thing more than 700 times, Mm -hmm. which is like, I think it was running out every like seven, eight minutes. Mm -hmm. Like I can refill my, my large scale, you know, planter and I can go plant for three hours without stopping Mm -hmm. versus some of these smaller equipment that I've we'd have to refill a lot. So again, it just boils back to, we got to automate the next step, which would be refilling, uh, refueling, changing batteries, right? A lot of these are battery powered, of course, yeah. not, not fossil fuel. A lot of these like basic tasks that, yeah. you know, um, like I, I grew up in Florida, right? And I, I'm sure that you're, you're probably familiar, but Florida has a huge agricultural base. And huge. like my, my parents used to, um, used to take out, us out to like these you pick farms you know like where you would like go and it was like a, it was like a, like an event like like oh we're gonna like go pick our own strawberries like sure. this was like something that was like enjoyable but it was like terrible work it was so difficult yeah you know and that was me like you know in middle school or something like that and i see that as like the natural progression for robots like i would hope that totally some agree. of these more like menial tasks like can be offloaded to them so that human beings can be used for things that we get a little bit more enjoyment out of like, that's what I hope that technology does in general. It's just like, let's, let's focus on like our family and like hanging out with each other and like, you know, that kind of stuff while the robot is taking care of like, you know, the dishes and stuff, things that like, I don't want to do, you know? So, so I hope, I hope that's the, the future that we have in our house and also in your farm. I think that's something that everybody can like really look forward to, but we are getting close to the end of our time. So I did want to finish with the same three questions that I ask all my guests just to kind of get an idea of people who are pushing the future forward, just like yourself, like where are they coming from and and what is it that they're thinking about? So first one for me, as you can obviously tell behind me, it's about uh, inspiration. I get a lot of my inspiration from science fiction. When I look at all the different media that's associated with science fiction, utopian science fiction is something that I really look forward to. Like I would love to live in a world without disease or hunger or, you know, any of these things where we as humans can really maximize our own capabilities um, without any of the the difficulties that we're experiencing right now. But that's me. What about you? What Where do yeah. you gain your inspiration from? I think a lot of mine, you know, comes from that legacy aspect, right? So the being yeah. a seventh generation farmer, 150 years, I've got a legacy to uphold, right? Mm-hmm. My family and the generations before me that had to do this stuff without this technology, without this automation, they mm-hmm. really had it tough, right? And luckily they were able to struggle through and make it to set me up for success. So I want to be able to continue to carry that on. But then at Continuum Ag, we're doing it at scale, right? Where we're working currently, we're in 43 states and 20 countries trying mm-hmm. to help our mission is to help a million family farms profit from improving their soil health. Because I know that regenerative agriculture is the future. You can be more profitable, just like my small family farm, but we can scale it to get all these positive outcomes. So to me, that's you know that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from is helping those family farms, the own legacy of my operation. But I just see that regenerative agriculture is so much more promising than the ag system that we're in today. Agriculture mm-hmm. is one of the highest suicide rates of any industry. Wow. Which is I didn't crazy know that. to think. That is yeah. crazy to think about. Yeah. And the and the reason being is in this industrial system, we just a lot of farmers kind of feel like they're on the hamster wheel, right? Mm. And you're just kind of stuck in this high input system where our margins are terrible margins because it's very open, right? We're in a commodity system. So yeah. Companies that are selling inputs know exactly how much money we're making. Therefore, they know exactly how much they can charge for those products to 
help us to skimp through, right? And pay down the banker and the operating line, but it's very heavy debt um, financed industry, very, uh, you know, hamster wheel type of system that I think a lot of, and it's very lonely out here in rural America, right? A farmer could be out there on their farm all day, you know, 12, 14 hour days for multiple days on end without any break besides maybe to go to church for a couple hours on Sunday morning, and then it's back at it, right? That's a, the life of a lot of, of family farms, um, hard work day in, day out, and not make a whole lot of money at the end of the day. So I just see a better future where farmers can be more profitable, be more resilient, mm -hmm. and invest back in those rural communities, which in my mind are really just that backbone of, of at least of middle America, for sure. Yeah, I, I have my two other questions, but I, I just wanted to ask you uh, just a side question. So we're going to do four for you as opposed to my normal three. Yeah, yeah. So like when you're <laughs> when you're out there and you're working 12 hours a day by yourself or maybe with like one other person, like do you listen to music? Do you listen to podcast? Like what kind of content do you listen yeah. to or, re or, you know, experience to make the day more enjoyable. Cause like, I can tell you in the operating room, when I'm in the operating room for 10 hours a day, like I'm listening to music, I'm not listening to a podcast, but just no. similar experience, a very hardworking job. Yeah. Like, what do you, what kind of content do you consume? It's an, it's an array of stuff, definitely podcasts, you know, um, so very much podcasts, all the, you know, a lot of the new tractors are all Bluetooth and stuff, right? So mm -hmm. you can do them from your phone. It's all the new radios and stuff, but so podcasts, but plenty of music as well. But now the greatest thing that's happened to me and, and I, here recently is having youtube tv on my phone oh, and so i can be out there because we're talking about harvesting stuff yeah. right football season so i'm like oh i'm out oh there. my god that's oh, great it's, it's living the, the dream you know so yeah. i got the tractor going it's driving itself i'm just chilling with yeah with that's not with a the, bad life you should promote that i guarantee more people would want to go into agriculture because like I, awesome. can't, I can't watch youtube while i'm you know doing surgery yeah. right no. yeah yeah we can while we're out there now the problem in for a lot of you know our landscape very rolling landscapes of uh, self signal and rural broadband availability, stuff like that. Like, so there's so, some of those things that technology mm -hmm. still catch up on, but, mm -hmm. but um, no, it's an array of, of different things. Right. That's cool. But, but what's cool. fun is, you know, when you're out there on the farm, you're working with mother nature, right? The days go mm -hmm. super fast. I'm sure a lot of your days just fly by too, yeah. which you love. Right. And that's the same yeah. thing what we're doing. Like farmers farm, because they they love it right mm -hmm. and with mother nature and in that positive future that we're talking but yeah no that's awesome man I, I i always wonder you know because like we're all so different but we're all so similar right and like you know especially when you hear people doing something that's like very uh similar experience like i just want to kind of know like how do they make the day a little bit better you know uh anyway next question where do you see agriculture in 10 years like yeah. what or what do you hope that you see from agriculture in 10 years. Yeah, this brings up uh, one of the topics I wanted to hit on, which is that data-driven agriculture where we are more connected to the consumer, right? The consumer is more connected with where the products are coming from and all that. But I see a lot of movement around lowering the carbon footprint of agriculture and uh, in lowering carbon intensity, okay? So agriculture is part of pretty much every supply chain that's out there. We're providing fuel through ethanol, we're providing food, we're providing uh, industrial materials, right? Lots of stuff coming from, ag from agriculture. And today, U.S. agriculture is 10% of the U.S. carbon footprint. So we're 10% of the footprint, right? So it's energy, transportation, buildings and stuff. And agriculture, we're, we're a huge part of the carbon footprint, but we're taking a lot of focus on decarbonizing quantifying carbon intensity. My farm is actually carbon negative, meaning that instead of losing carbon and having a carbon footprint polluting the atmosphere as a result of farming, we are actually carbon negative because of these regenerative practices, right? Mm -hmm. Putting all, it back in the All these things we talked about. But the, the opportunity here in the future is to really be able to tell that story. There's some interesting things happening with the Inflation Reduction Act and being able to create low carbon renewable biofuels that when we're filling up our gas tanks, we can actually do it with American grown, regeneratively produced, low carbon fuel rather than just use fossil fuel. You mm -hmm. know, that, uh, mm -hmm. as of course a really high carbon footprint. So a lot of opportunity there for that connecting with the consumer where I can show them, hey, here's the practices, but here's some data about my carbon footprint, about my biological impact. That's absolutely where I see things going to telling that story.
That's great. So last question, as I kind of alluded to, the, the technology that's not really associated with my field, but I just can't get enough of, like I'm reading it and I'm just so excited about it. For me, it's consumer robots. Like I cannot wait until I have a robot that can fold my laundry for me. I'll tell you that is yeah. going to be, I'm going to be first in line for that robot. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's something that I'm really excited about. Um, but everybody has different, you know, I was talking with one guy, he was really excited about the new Apple Vision Pro, like the augmented reality. Another guy was talking about just like artificial intelligence assistance. Like, you know, it'd be great to just, hey, uh, Siri, you know, get me a barbershop appointment tomorrow at 2.30, you know, and it just does it for you. But what about you? What's what what kind of technology is coming down the pipeline? Probably not agriculturally associated, yeah. or it could be, but you just can't get enough of. You're like so excited about. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely enjoyed like those uh yeah, the robotic type stuff, like where you're talking and man, having that like Roomba to just vacuum while you're mm -hmm. not it's freaking awesome. But uh mm -hmm. I don't know where my head went to that I'm super bullish on is the NFT blockchain type of concept where it's having that decentralized system for creating contracts for that transparency for yeah monitoring carbon footprint and all this stuff but very bullish on that um i've only dabbled in nfts a little bit at this point but obviously new technology but very bullish on where that is going to go with uh just tokenizing everything more transparency and everything decentralization uh so that's uh that NFT piece, I think I'll end up, you know, with with businesses and stuff in that space in the future, likely, of course, combining some of that technology with agriculture, but very bullish on that concept. That's cool, man. Well, thank you so much for being with us. As always, for those of you guys who are joining us regularly, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out. It really helps people like Mitchell out. So feel yeah. free to add me to your normal podcast that you're listening to on the tractor. But regardless, have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Mitchell, for coming to see us. Thanks. Awesome to hang out. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.